The one who filled the oceans, hung the stars, invented life, has now placed in us his very spirit. A spirit of courage, of power, a spirit of love. My brothers and sisters, we have not been gathered together simply to sit and marvel at the works of an anointed few. Each and every one of us has been empowered and called from the sidelines to the front lines. We are called to a life of love, joy, pain, sacrifice, a life of action. So sometimes I wonder, what all could God do through us? Hey guys, looking forward to uh, time in the Word this morning. Before I dive into our sermon for today, uh, I want to give you guys a quick commercial for the sermon series that we have coming up. We try to get you all ahead of this by a couple of weeks. That's what those inviter cards are uh, in your seats. We're going to be launching a new series in two weeks called Already Not Yet. And the idea behind that is that we're going to do a deep dive for pretty much the rest of the fall in the book of Ephesians. And we're going to talk about how Christians live in a unique time. We live between two comings of Christ. He has come once, but he's coming again. Uh, and, and we live right here in this small section of time in human history where the kingdom of God has broken through, but it is not fully realized. And man, there's just a ton of implications of living in this age with the spirit of God at work in the people of God. And we wanna really explore that stuff through the book of Ephesians. And so, man, I hope you guys will get fi fired up about that. One way to think about the book of Ephesians and this idea of already not yet and what God is doing in the age that we live in now is kind of like this, okay? Uh, I don't know if y'all seen, but they are remaking every movie under the sun, right? You've seen all these remakes. <clears throat> it came out this week that they are contemplating remaking The Princess Bride, okay? Collective boo right now, everybody. Okay, we need that. Right, why? Because you don't mess with perfection, right? Is that not right? It's inconceivable, okay, that you would, uh, you know, some of y'all get that. If you're, if you're under the age of like 30, you're like, man, I don't even know what that movie is. So, um, but anyway, I thought about what, I thought about, they, they, I heard a radio guy talking about this, and they were talking about all the movies that should be deemed untouchable, and he was talking about Princess Bride. Well, the next one they said was, they said the other one that is untouchable is Back to the Future. And I just, <clears throat> it got me thinking about that Back to the Future. You know, I've, he I've heard the kingdom of God explained this way, that I think is really good. You think about a movie like Back to the Future, you think about any kind of time travel movie, what's happening? We are getting transported forward, right? or we are getting transported back. That's sort of how time travel works in, in movies and all that kind of stuff. Well, what happens with the kingdom of God, and this is what Ephesians kind of shows us, is it's not that we are translated forward, it's that the kingdom of God has been uh, translated kind of backwards and broken into where we live right now. There's a slice of the kingdom that is coming that is available to us right now, and it changes the way that we live and the way that we look at the world. Uh, and so anyway, we're going we're gonna to be diving into that. Y'all take those inviter cards, man. If somebody comes to your mind that you're thinking, man, this would be a great thing for them to dive into, then man, that's why we have those there for y'all. So y'all can certainly be in prayer for me. Ephesians is one of my favorite books. Uh, love, looking, really looking forward to getting a chance to preach through it. So we'll be doing that in a couple weeks. All right, here we go. For today, if you have a copy of Scripture, I'm going to ask you to take it out and turn with me to two places. I know you're already probably going to Romans 12, which is right but I also want you to take it and hold Romans 12, but also turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 4, okay? For the first little section here, I'm talking about the first couple minutes, I'm going to talk about 1 Peter 4, and I want you to actually see it in your copy of Scripture. If you don't have a copy of Scripture today, maybe you're newer, we're going to have what you need on the screen. But as you guys are finding those passages of Scripture, let me go ahead and lay out for y'all where we are going. This is the final descent on our current series, kind of this journey of no more spectators getting kicked off with a sermon series. It's going to carry us for a few years here in terms of just the emphasis and focus. Uh, we're coming to the final descent of this thing where we're getting into the actual game plan. This is what we need to do. How are you gifted? Uh, here's the big idea for today. God is gracious to build the church through speaking gifts. You want me to go ahead and give you the big idea for next week? I'll give it to you, okay? God is gracious to build the church through serving gifts. 
There are speaking gifts and there are serving gifts, and those are really the two buckets that our giftings come out of. Every one of us in here that is a believer is gifted in some way. There's kind of a matrix of gifts. You probably have a lead gift, and it's probably getting drawn out of either the speaking bucket or the serving bucket, and we're gonna try to break all those things down so that we can have a really good understanding of how we go from here towards, the, you know, towards the, this chapter of our church called No More Spectators in terms of what we're getting into in the community and all of that. Now, here's how I wanna, here's how I wanna set this up for these next two weeks, especially in relation to last week if you were here I know some of you might be newer. I can give you a little bit of the play-by-play from last week, okay? Last week was the raw, raw sermon, okay? It was like, man, get off the sideline is your yes on the table sermon. But I want to talk to you guys for just a minute about how if we don't have these other two pieces, then that one isn't going to matter very much, all right? Now, just follow this. I I remember when I was in high school, I think it's a good way to explain it. When I was in high school, I I had a chance to play on our our JV basketball team, which was really a ninth grade freshman basketball team because my high school was brand new the year I went as a freshman and we didn't have a senior class. They were going to graduate into the senior class. So our freshman team was playing against everybody else's JV team, which is usually freshman and sophomore. So we were kind of at a disadvantage anyway. And then we had to play this team uh, out of Palatka, Palatka High School. If any of you guys are familiar with Northeast Florida, Palatka has produced a lot of athletes. They've had tradition in football and basketball and all these types of things for years. And so we had to play Palatka. I knew we were in trouble when we're all out there, you know, 14 years old, and they come out, they're dunking during warm-ups, okay? And we're like, man, we're in trouble here, okay? Well, we were in trouble. Uh, we ended up losing by 20 by halftime, okay? So uh, we go into the locker room at halftime, and we're down 20, and we're all sitting there, you know, heads, heads down and all that kind of stuff. And we hear the coach come in, but it ain't the JV basketball coach. It's the varsity basketball coach walks in, Okay, and he comes in and he shuts the door to the locker room where nobody can hear. And the first thing he does is throws a trash can uh, across, the, across the locker room. Man, he starts to give us what for, like I have never heard. I mean, cussing us up and down, paints peeling off the walls, never repeated himself for five minutes, okay? It's that type of thing. And some of y'all that are athletes, maybe you've sat through that before. And then like a ghost, as, as quick as he was in, he was gone. And we're all sitting there. And for whatever reason, it just lit a fire in a bunch of 14-year-olds, okay? And we all of a sudden are just like jumping up and down in the locker room. We're doing like the basketball chants. We're clapping. We're like, man, we're going to, you know, shock the basketball world in the freshman 14-year-old basketball class. And we're just, I mean, we go out there during, you know, the warm-ups after halftime, and we're just going crazy. Y'all, we lost by 40, okay? It didn't matter. (laughs) And, and listen, this is, the, this is the reason I share that story with you. And you know this to be true from work or coaching or whatever. All of the rah-rah in the world doesn't matter if the game plan doesn't change. Like if the game plan is the same game plan you had that got you beat by 20, you're going to lose by 40. It doesn't matter how hyped up you are and jumping up and down and all this kind of stuff. Here's why I bring that up. Last week, if you were here, and if you weren't, I can summarize it for you. You are called to serve. Are you going to? Yes on the table. Is your life a blank check? Last week, the whole idea was, let's get fired up, little exhortation in the room, okay? Let's get fired up about going out and doing the things that God has called us to do. But that motivation will not last over the long haul, and it won't have the impact over the long haul that we need to have if we don't get the game plan the right way. The X's and O's have got to line up as well. You can't just run on rah-rah. We've got to get the X's and O's in the right place. So, This week and next week, if you're trying to put all this together, this week and next week is the game plan. This week and next week is the X's and O's. How are we going to execute what we're excited about? Let me give you the game plan. Here it is. It's very simple. If you got a speaking gift, speak. If you got a serve gift, serve. That's simple, isn't it? (laughs) It ain't the most complicated thing. Are we excited? Great. Have you identified your giftings? If it's a speaking gift, off the sideline to the front line, speak. If it's a serve gift, you need to serve. And so that's what we're going to do for two weeks. Now, the first place in the scripture I want us to go to is 1 Peter 4.10. And the reason is because I don't want you guys to think that I've drawn these buckets of speaking gifts, serving gifts out of nowhere because we think it's cute. It's right here in 1 Peter 4. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's very grace. Listen, whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God and whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God has supplied. See, 
serve and strength, uh, serve and speak. If you have a speaking gift, do it. That's the game plan. If you have a serving gift, do it. That's the game plan. In order that in everything God might be glorified through Jesus Christ, to him belongs the glory and dominion forever and ever. There are two buckets that we're going to draw from. I'm not saying this is the only way to think about this. I've heard other pastors break giftings up in different ways. I'm just saying I think a very uh, biblical, we can pull it right from 1 Peter, way to think about it generally is that the giftings are gonna fall in a speaking team or a serving team. Not saying you can't have giftings that are both, but probably you're gonna be lead gifted, a primary gifting, and you're gonna be on one of these two sides. Uh, it's like two leagues of the same kind of teams. You, you think about the you know football, AFC versus NFC. Or you think about baseball, American League versus National League. Or you think about hockey, which I have I have no clue what the leagues are. Okay, so I don't know if they even have leagues. They probably have three leagues. They got three half times in their sports. So anyway, uh, I think about uh, you know three periods. So I, I don't know, but I think whatever league it is, whatever team it is. I want you guys to think over the next two weeks, man, I'm fired up for the kingdom. I want to get off the sideline. Okay, good. All right. Now, how? It's probably going to manifest primarily as a speaker or as a server. Not saying you can't do both. Okay. But it's going to primarily come off as a speaking gift or a leading gift or a serving gift. And if we can get that right, then it's really going to point us in the right direction that when you get on no more spectators.com and you click on serving in the church or serving in the community, you're going to be able to know these are some things I ought to be looking for in the community. These are some things I ought to be looking for in the church because of my gifting. Today, we're going to look at the speaking gifts. Let's read this Romans 12, six. If you got that in your copy of scripture, you can flip back over to Romans 12. Let's go ahead and get into it here. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. That was our sermon last week. Raw, raw, right? Are we going to serve? Is our yes on the table? If the answer to that is yes, then this week really matters because now we're going to get into which side we go to and how it looks. Now, here's, let me set this up, verse, verse, the, the second half of verse 6 and 7. I think this is what Paul's going to do. He's going to use those buckets, speaking, serving, and he's going to introduce them as prophecy and serving. Then he's going to explain them as in the prophetic speaking side is prophecy and teaching and exhortation. And in the serve side is going to be serving, leading, generosity, and mercy. Okay? So it's just like if you were writing the opening sentence of a paragraph, you know, like in high school or whatever, and you're writing like an introductory, uh, you're going to say, hey, today we're going to talk about speaking and serving. Now, the speaking side is teaching and exhortation. The serving side is leading, generosity, and mercy. I think that's what he does here. Watch. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, that's the speaking side. Verse 7, if service in our serving, that's the serve side. Now he's going to switch back and further explain the prophecy side. The one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation. So three speaking gifts. Prophecy, which I think is kind of a leader among these. And we're going to talk about it the most primarily today. Prophecy, teaching, exhortation. But now he switches back. Hey, let me explain the serving side. Serving in his, uh, the one who contributes, the one in generosity, who, uh, the one who contributes in generosity, sorry, the one who leads with zeal, and the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. Okay, is that about clear as mud? All right, it's, it, it's, it's, it's really kind of simple when you think about it. Prophecy, teaching, exhortation, all right, serving, leading, generosity, mercy. Next week's sermon is over here. It's going to be on the serve side. This week's sermon is on the speaking side, and we're going to get into these three, prophecy, teaching, and exhortation. Look at verse 6 one more time. If if prophecy in proportion to our faith, this is the one I want to talk about first, then we're going to talk about teaching and exhortation. Here's the whole sermon for today. Let me explain what prophecy, teaching, and exhortation is with the primary, uh, primary, primary emphasis on prophecy. And then we're going to call everybody off the sideline to the front line. If you're a speaking gift, you need to speak. If you have a speaking gift, you need to speak. That's going to be our time together, all right? When we get into prophecy, we got to do some of the heavy lifting here, and we got to get a little deeper theologically here, and that's what we're going to do. If this ain't the most exciting stuff in the world, that was the sermon for last week, <laughs> okay? Today's X's and O's. Today's, today's the game plan. And the game plan is you got to understand how you're gifted, and if you're gifted in the speaking side, you probably need to understand some of the differences in prophecy, teaching, and exhortation, and that's what I want to do. So let's ask a question first, y'all. Prophecy, what is it? I think it's a good definition. Prophecy is speaking what God has spoken. Prophecy is speaking the words of God. 
It is not hearing something and sitting on it. It is hearing something and declaring it. It is not hearing something and ignoring it. It is hearing something and shouting it from the rooftops in the particular setting that it needs to be shouted from, okay? If it's in one person's life, or if it is something that, that is prophetic in terms of crying out to the culture, maybe that happens in a sermon or something like that, okay? It is that spirited person who has a fire that is burning on the inside. Maybe more poetically, you could say it like this. Prophecy is a flame in the heart to cry out to a people or a person or a culture. It is a fire that has to get out. And maybe some of you understand that in terms of that prophetic gifting. You feel like, man, I, I feel that. Like the word of God will come upon my soul so strong for a particular person. I'll see a situation where I need to encourage someone or I need to call them out on something that's going on. I need to speak the word of God and a, 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 a verse will get in your soul where it's like, man, I, I've got to get this out right now. Like it's burning within me. That's prophetic. That's what prophecy is getting at. Now, one nuance here that I think all of us need to take, take pretty seriously is this. Uh, you know, somebody might say, well, I don't have a teaching gift or a prophetic gift or an exhortation gift. What's in this for me? Well, there's a sense in which Christians are all called to do all of these things. I mean, in general, what, what things on these lists are we not all called to do? It's not like you say, well, my gift is uh, prophecy, therefore I don't have to be merciful. I'm just mean. It's like, no, it doesn't work like that, right? Like, we're all called to everything on these lists. You're called, you know, if you're like, man, my, my gifting is mercy, are you not also called to generosity? Like, are you not also called to speak? I would say that we are all called to prophecy and to teaching in a few different ways. Think about this, a couple different scriptures. Joel 2, 28 tells us, I will pour out my spirit on what? On who? On all flesh. Okay, our, your sons and daughters will prophesy. What does he say in Colossians 3, 16 about the word of Christ? It says the word of Christ will dwell in you richly. He's talking about teaching there, I think, primarily. But the point is that even if you're not gifted in teaching, there is a sense in which every believer is called to teach. Those in your household, those that you're around, maybe those that, that are older, pouring into younger, like we're all called to these things. I think about this. There is no Christian here that doesn't understand something of prophecy in terms of the mystery of the gospel. You say, well, that, what does that mean? Now, let, me, let me tell you. 1 Corinthians 13, 2. If I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and even if I have all faith, so as to remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. Look what he said. If I have all prophetic powers and understand all mysteries. In some sense, I think 1 Corinthians 13, 2 is a really good uh, indicator of what is prophetic. It is when the mysteries are understood. Let me ask you this, Christian. What Christian among us doesn't have a full understanding of the most mysterious thing of all that was concealed from the beginning of the world, which is Christ and the gospel? Every one of us understand that mystery. If you didn't understand it, you wouldn't be a Christian. So what he's saying here is, hey, all believers have some sense of a prophetic call that we speak in. What is it to do evangelism? What is it to go out and to make disciples of all nations? Prophecy is wrapped up in a lot of that. And so all of us are called to do these things. But I think this is important for us to know. Some people are gifted in them in a way that the fruit and the joy, this is coming from a pastor named John Piper, the fruit and the joy uh, in that thing is probably going to indicate this is not something you're called to generally, it's something you're gifted in specifically. And for many of us in here, that gifting specifically is prophecy and teaching and exhortation. Specifically, we're talking about prophecy now. If I said, hey, are you gifted in prophecy? Somebody in here might say, man, I've never thought about this, but I know I've never had uh, a dream about the end times. I mean, I read the Left Behind series and all that, but I don't know that I'm like a total prophet, you know? That's what some of us in here are, are thinking. Like, I, I've never had like a prophetic, listen, prophecy is not all that crazy. You know, you don't, it doesn't have to be something crazy is what I'm trying to get you to see. More prophecy probably happens around kitchen tables than it does on late night TBN television or in, in some kind of crazy church service or whatever. Like more prophecy happens as people are speaking the word of God to each other as God has laid it on their heart. I think probably many of you already know where I'm going with this, but if that's true and it's speaking the words of God, how does the Bible play into this? I think it plays into it primarily. Okay, I think, it, I think it's like the overwhelming majority. I would say it like this, prophecy is primarily speaking the scripture into people's lives. Why? Because anything else that we receive from God, we have to filter through a fallen grid that we have to always couch with, man, I feel like God's saying this, but I'm not totally sure. I feel like I, I have a prophetic word, but I'm not totally sure. 
But what does the Bible say about itself? 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All Scripture is given by the inspiration of God. The claim of the Bible is that it is from the Lord, and we take that to be the testimony of the people that were around Jesus at the time that God used his spirit speaking through them to write these scriptures down for us. Like this is the primary way that prophecy goes forward. This is how we know. It's the willingness to look in the Bible and to say there is a wise path. It's the willingness to look in the Bible and say, Jesus is coming back and there's a kingdom that's coming that you need to be ready for. It's the willingness to look in the Bible to say, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. This is prophecy. Some of us in here are going to say this. This is what you're going to say. You're going to say, well, that, is that not evangel- the gift of evangelism? And how much of that is prophecy versus teaching and all that? One thing I think is really true about the gifts that I've tried to get my mind around because I think very linearly is that many of us want to bring an engineer's mind to the gifts in the Bible, and we don't need to think about it like an engineer. We, think, we need to think about it more like an artist. Okay, because how arrogant is it for us to say, well, this is where the prophetic gifting ends and the evangelistic gifting begins. Uh, this is where the teaching one begins and the prophecy ends and all that kind of stuff. Even in our own soul, there is a unique fingerprint, a gifting matrix in your life. And some of these things begin to come together, but they center primarily on, with, on us speaking the word of God to each other. Now, is speaking the Bible the only form of prophecy? I know this is going to pique some people's interest in here, uh, depending on the tradition that you come from. I would not be willing to say that. Uh, I think it's extra biblical to say that. While prophecy is mostly speaking from the Bible, and it is concrete when it comes from the Bible, and it's something that we know when it comes from the Bible, it is not only from the Bible. I don't know how we would ever get there. I mean, I understand how some people have tried to make that argument, but just looking at the Bible for what it is, I don't know how we would get to the place where we would say prophetic giftings have ended. In other words, I would say, man, God can speak through you and to you in ways that are outside of the Bible, does that put them on par with Scripture? No, because we're fallen. We, can't, we always have to couch things when we're like, man, I feel like God is speaking to me in this way. I could be right. I could be wrong. We know from the Scripture it's concrete. We can stand on it. But because we can stand on the Bible as concrete, it has led people away from wanting to talk about anything prophetic that is not coming from the Bible. And that's not just in our generation. Y'all, churches have been trying to ice out prophets for 2,000 years. How do I know? Because 1 Thessalonians 5, 19, 20, and 21, which I'm going to reference in a minute and read to you, you know what it says? It says, don't despise prophecy. Right when the church was getting going, people were willing to say, like, man, let's just get away from that gift. Okay, let's get away from the prophetic giftings. Why? Because they're weird and we don't know how to handle it or whatever. Well, just because it ain't, you know, as clear cut as maybe we would like it in our modern, enlightened, engineer kind of linear minds doesn't mean God doesn't want to do great things through it. I would call us not to despise the, prof- the prophet, the prophecy gift, prophesying gifts that we have today. Uh, you know, I think about this, uh, you know, people who um, maybe you've met somebody like this, man, within one minute, they know you got a sin issue going on in your life. Man, God's, God is, God is their, their spirit striving. God is revealing something to them. Maybe there's people in here that you've had this experience where you sit down with someone and you can immediately tell, man, they've been, there's abuse that has gone on in their life. There's something they're holding. There's a stronghold here. Maybe you know that. You can speak in. God is revealing something to you and he gives you something to say to that person for their encouragement, for their building up. Maybe there is a dream that you've had and, and, and you think, man, this dream is supernatural and we got to understand there is a great deal of discernment that comes with that because, uh, you know, God ain't the only one in the, in the game of, of sending dreams and giving thoughts. It could be satanic. I mean, we got to discern. There's a lot of discernment that goes into this stuff. But just to wholesale say, well, it doesn't happen, I think it goes way too far. 1 Corinthians 14.3 tells us what the point of all this is, is for the building up of the church. You know, on the other hand, the one who prophesies speaks to the people for their upbuilding, their encouragement, their consolation. If you have been given something that is outside of the Bible, I promise you that it ain't about which stocks to buy or where to go to college. Okay, that's what we think about with prophets. They have a crystal ball. No, it's about the encouragement. It is about the building of the body. It is about somebody being uh, in their soul being strengthened because of a prophetic word from the Lord. You know, I, everybody, I know you're going to say, well, what's an example of this uh, maybe for, you know, that I can kind of get my mind around? Well, let me give you one example of this. I've shared this story, I think, one other time, and I'll keep it in generalities. You know, the first year we planted Mercy Hill. If you've ever planted a church, you're going to know this. Uh, man, it just feels so fragile. I, I mean, like, it feels so fragile. And it's not, and God has it, and it was never in your hands, but buddy, it don't feel that way. Especially when you're 28, you come plant a church, you move your whole family here and all that. 
And the first year of our church, it felt that way to me. It felt like, man, if I make one mistake, the whole thing's going to break. Everybody's going to leave. <laughs> we're not going to have a church. You know, I mean, it just felt like that. And I, and I dealt with a lot of that that first year that we were here. And I remember in December of 2012, I had a dream one night. And I woke up. It was one of those dreams that you wake up kind of in a cold sweat the next morning. And you're like, man, that was a spiritual dream. Now, I've learned in my life because I feel like I've had the enemy try to sow uh, discouragement into my life before through supernatural dreams. Just because a dream is supernatural doesn't mean it's from God. I think we got to understand that. But I remember waking up and I remember thinking to myself, like, man, that was a supernatural dream. I feel like it was from the Lord. I'm not sure. I immediately went to our elders uh, that day. We were driving over to Raleigh. And I said, hey, man, I don't know what to do with this, but I've got to share this with you guys. Uh, maybe nothing's going to come of it, but just, just in case, like, I've got to get this out, that prophetic. Like, man, something has been given to me, and I've got to give it to the leaders in our church. And so we came to, I came to our, our other two elders at the time, and I said to them, I said, man, I had a dream. I feel like it's from God. I, know, I feel like I know it was supernatural. I don't know. Maybe the enemy's trying to trick me here. I don't know. I feel like it's from God. This family is going to leave our church. And they're not just going to leave, but they're going to try to sow some discord when they go, and they're going to take some young believers with them. And that's what the dream was. And we rode all the way to Raleigh, like, man, I, I don't know. What, what do you do with that? You know? I mean, how do you, what are you supposed to do? It had been, I feel like it had been given to me. I feel like I voiced it. We decided as an elder team like, what I'm going to advocate for in a minute. We said, hey, man, there's not, this is not Bible. I can't test it against the Bible. It's something extra biblical. The thing to do for us is to wait and to watch and just to, just to sit on it and hide it in our heart. And y'all, what, a month and a half later, that that family, in an email, in a, in a pretty discouraging way, left our church. Um, just like that, up and gone. Uh, the next day, two very young believers that they had been walking with sent the exact same email, almost a form email, about why they couldn't be with us anymore. They left the church. And about a month after that, uh, heartbreakingly, another guy that I had been walking with that was, that, was, that was very close to us, had been baptized in our church, he left the church all over this whole thing. Now you think, man, okay, that's, that's kind of crazy. Let me tell you why I bring it up here in relation to that passage from 1 Corinthians 14. That whole situation was crushing to me, but it was not nearly as crushing as it would have been if I had not had that dream. <laughs> you understand? It was a hard season. It was a tough thing to walk through. But every time I had the thought of, man, the fragileness and who else is going to leave, every single time I had that thought, the other thought came to the other side of my brain that said, you think this was in your hands to begin with? I've seen this was going to happen before it ever even, before you ever planted the church. I knew this was going to happen. It's my church. It's for the sake of my renown. It's for my glory. It's not in your hands. It's not on your back. It's not as fragile as you think. I've got it. I've undergirded you. Those were the thoughts that came through, not only me, but our elder team because of that dream. The only thing I'm trying to get us to see is it ain't about stocks. It ain't about, it ain't about where you go to college. It's about the encouragement of the church, the building up of the church. Now, I know what the question is after I share something like that, okay? The question is, well, if you open that door, won't it lead to fanaticism in the church? Well, it can if you disregard other scriptures, right? What did the Bible say here, Romans 12, 6? If prophecy, prophesy, listen, in proportion to our faith. You know what phrase that is almost identical to and certainly harkens back to? is what I talked about two or three weeks ago when I talked about the measure of faith that we are given. Remember, what is the measure of faith we were given? It's not a measuring cup. It's not like you get this much faith and you get this much faith and you get this much faith, remember? It's more like this. It's a measuring stick. Remember, the me it's like, hey, the measure of faith is Christ. It's the gospel. It's what the measure, the standard that we have all been given. What he's saying in this passage is to prophesy in accordance with the standard. Okay, so look at the, th that's how I know this. If somebody says to me, for example, okay, you've opened this door for prophecy. I had a dream. God told me to leave my family because I'm not happy. No, he didn't. <laughs> Why? No, he didn't. It's like, well, you can't tell me what God told me. Uh, yeah, I can. It crashes against the Bible. Like what you're saying in your falling condition is crashing against what we have in an infallible word of God. He has given us the standard. You say you're supposed to leave your family. Don't measure up, bud. It's not, it's not, it's not the right thing. You must have heard wrong. Maybe it was a different type, maybe it was a supernatural dream, but it wasn't from God. Like, there's a lot of things that could be. We are supposed to test the prophecies against the measure of faith, against the Bible, the scripture, the faith that has been once delivered for all the saints. Now, 
One more question in this whole thing. Okay, I know I keep kind of going down in, in sort of this logical fashion here because I know what the next questions are because I've, I've worked through all of these many times over. The next question is, yeah, but Andrew, uh, the, the dream you had is not one you can just lay up against the Bible. Like, are they going to leave or are they not going to leave? And, are, you know, what do we do in that situation? Well, I would tell you we're still called to test. I'm not saying that. Book of 1 Thessalonians says that. 1 Thessalonians 5.20, do not despise prophecies, Right here it says it in verse 21, but test everything. We have got to be a testing bunch of people if we are going to understand and work from prophetic giftings. It's easy to wholesale write off prophecy because then you don't have to test anything. But what the scripture is calling us to is not to despise, instead to test. Well, how do you test something? Hey, man, God called me to leave my family. No, he didn't. I've laid that up next against the Bible. That's the easy stuff, though, right? What about the one where you say, okay, well, how do you test? Are they going to leave the church? You had a prophecy, you know, Acts, in the book of Acts, a guy named Agabus, he prophesied that there was going to be a famine. That, you can't lay that up against the Bible. It's like, how do you do it? You test it by what? I, I, this is what I would say. Bible stuff, you test against the measure of faith the Bible. Other stuff, you watch and wait. You watch and see. Why? Because it's all about the encouragement of the church anyway. If it happens, we're going to be encouraged. If it's not, bud, you know, that wasn't God. It was a taco you ate the night before or something else. I don't know, but it wasn't, it wasn't it, right? Okay, let me give you an example of how destructive this can be. Many people in our culture, especially our young people, man, they don't even know where the phrase drink the Kool-Aid comes from anymore. Many of you, all, you know, most of you guys know. It comes from, 19, it comes from uh, 1978, November 18th, jo Jonestown, Guyana. There was a so-called prophet who, because of his charismatic personality, was able to convince 1,000 people, including over 300 children, to drink the Kool-Aid, purple, you know, purple Kool-Aid laced with cyanide, and the bodies are littered everywhere. How does a guy get that many people to move that far? How does he keep that type of control? How does he do all that? No one was testing him. That when he stood up and he said, quote, you need a friend, I'll be your friend. You need a father, I'll be your father. You need a savior, I'll be your savior. You need a God, I'll be your God. Nobody said, man, that crashes against the word. You are a false prophet. When he said, hey, there's gonna be a nuclear holocaust on July 15th, 1967, which he peddled, and it didn't happen, nobody stood up and said, dude, you're a false prophet. You've heard the wrong way. They didn't test and it leads to all types of chaos. Man, it leads to chaos in churches on smaller scales. You say, well, that's a crazy example. How does this work out in our life today? I'll give you, I'll give you an example of how it works out. I'll give you an example of my life uh, of how it works out. Okay, we test. I was preaching about three weeks ago, and I love this. I kept saying Proverbs 25, 8, over and over and over. Faithful brother comes up to me after the service in the right spirit, in love, because I've had conversations that go the other way, okay? In faith, in, in the right spirit, in love. And he says, hey, man, I looked up that verse. It ain't Proverbs 25, 8. It's Proverbs 28, 5. You got it flipped. It, it, it's like, I'm testing you. <laughs> you know what I mean? In the right spirit. There's nobody that should preach from this book or preach from this stage without testing. There's things that we're going to get wrong. And, then, and, that, and that's fine. There's things that we're, man, we're, you, know, you speak for 45 minutes, six times a weekend. Like, there's going to be things that, but we need to be testing, right? I'll give you another example from my life. Uh, I remember... Uh, a, a couple years ago on a mission trip with Mercy Hill, we were in the Dominic Dominican Republic. I had a chance to preach. Awesome church. Man, it was fun. After the sermon was over, uh, they came and they said, hey, uh, the, the, the pastor has a prophecy over you. God's given him a prophecy. And man, they all laid hands on us and uh, the pastor was prophesying over us. And man, it was a, it was a fantastic prophecy. It was about the, the scope of my ministry personally and our church. And man, we, you know, the ministry of this church is going to go to all four corners of the world. And I mean, numbers of churches planted. I mean, just, it was just fantastic. Very encouraging. And uh, I remember we walked out and my dad was with me and my dad was like, man, what did you think of that? And I said, we'll see. <laughs> right? I mean, I'm not, dude, I'm not going to do for, you know, I'm not doing First Thessalonians 5. I'm not going to despise it like a lot of people want to do. I'm not going to despise it, but I'm also not going to take a wholesale. We're going to watch. Maybe, and then one day we're going to see what God does with all of this. But I'm going to make sure that we are testing it in the right way. We've got to test these things. So you say, well, okay, prophecy, how does Mercy Hill shake out? And the word charismatic, which is kind of a buzzword, I heard a guy say it like this. I thought it was really good. Man, we're not a charismatic church in the way that people think, meaning what God says to me is on par with Scripture, and I can be certain on it and stand on it just like I can the Bible, that's not where we are here, okay? But at the same time, just because we're not charismatic doesn't mean that we're anti-charismatic gifts. We're not anti the gifts of God. 
Like if God is speaking in, if there are prophetic giftings, which I know there are in a body like this, man, we want to see those things utilized. All right, I've spent almost all my time on prophecy because I think it's probably uh, the lead gift here, and I think it's actually the most confusing. So let me do the other two very quickly, teaching and exhortation. It's going to go much faster. They're simpler. I think you can explain it like this. Y'all, teaching is expounding God's word. Exhortation is the call to action. Prophecy, teaching, exhortation. You say, well, what is preaching? Preaching is all three all the time, mixed in, barely can't figure out when you're doing one or the other. Last week's sermon was a lot of exhortation. Okay, sometimes the, ser- sometimes the sermons are very prophetic in terms of calling out to the culture, you know? There's a, there's a lot of things, that, but it's all mixed in all the time. Teaching is that explanation. Exhortation is when you call somebody to do it. Uh, one commentator said it like this. I thought it was a really good way to put it. Teaching concentrates more on the content of the tradition, while exhortation summons others to action. It stirs them out of their sleepiness. It stirs them to actually move. Preaching is all this stuff all the time. Sometimes it focuses more here or here. But these are, in big buckets, generally speaking, the teaching giftings, the speaking giftings. All right? So if you, let, let me do this, and then we'll go on to the application, and then we'll start, we'll start trying to really wrap this thing up with the X's and O's. Okay? If you're trying to get your mind around this, I think this is a good way to think about it. Prophecy, thus says the Lord. It's when that fire comes in your soul for somebody in your community group or a word of God that you're going to preach at a a, a community group or, or maybe with our students or maybe in a sermon or whatever. It's that fire that comes in you that you got to get this message out to this people and you got to say to them, for example, hey, God designed sexuality for marriage. That'd be, that'd be thus says the Lord. I'm not explaining it. I haven't gone in depth into it. I'm just telling you, God's got a design. And, and, and he wants you to know that. This is a verse from the Bible. God has a design for these things. That's prophecy, okay? Well, what's teaching? Teaching is when you say, hey, let's sit down, and I want to go back with you in verse by verse. I want to walk through Genesis 1 and 2. I want to show you and explain to you how God made all of creation. He made male and female, and he made them different, yet they're equal. But, man, they're not the same. If they were, one of them would be unnecessary. The fullness of the image of God is expressed in them. And, and I want you to see all of these things. And I want you to be able to tell and understand that's teaching. Well, what is exhortation? Exhortation is when the coach on the sideline, you ever had, you ever, I know I'm using a lot of sports analogy. I think it it goes well with this idea. You you know, you've, uh, you you ever been on, you know, seen a coach or been coached by anybody and the whole time they're just yelling like the command, the literal command, like they're yelling run or they're yelling like catch it, you know, or hit it or tackle. And you're like, what do you think I'm trying to do? You know, you're, you're yelling at me the thing. Well, that's sort of what exhortation is. Exhortation is, thus says the Lord. Let me explain it to you. Do it. Go out. Do it. That's kind of the idea here, all right? Now, all of us might be, if you're a speaking gift person, you might be gifted in all of these things, some of these things, one of these things. Maybe one of them is way out in front of the other. Your unique gifting matrix is probably unique to you, but these are the speaking gifts. Now, here's what I want to call us to today in terms of application. Y'all play your role in building the church through using your speaking gift. If you are X's and O's, game plan, if you have a speaking gift, speak. That's what it is. Now, can I try to motivate you for just a moment? By having you think about this, how dare we starve the church of the words that God has for them when God has not, Jesus has not starved us of the words that we desperately needed from him. If we desperately needed some words from God and he gave them to us, how could we be a people who starve the church of the words that he has for them through us? If you have a speaking gift, you say, what are you talking about? I'm talking about the gospel. I'm talking about the fact that you and I were sinners that were separated from God, but we have gone from sinner to son. We have gone from rebel to family. We have gone from orphan to adopted. We have gone from, I am so far from God, I deserve a godless eternity to come here, my child. Well done, good and faithful servant. You enter into my rest for all eternity. I won't count your sin against you, but I'll see you in the righteousness of Christ. Those are some words, right? And that's what's been spoken over us. And it took a servant to come and bring those words to us. It took Jesus Christ to come and to die on the cross for us. Jesus laid his life down on the cross and he took what we deserve, which is death and separation, so that he could give us what he deserved, which is righteousness, a family status with God once again. That's what the cross is, what it's all about. That Jesus went down so that you and I could go free and we could have the words of life spoken into us and over us, all because of what Christ has done. You know, I'm reading an interesting book right now, 1913 and 14. 
was the expedition that Theodore Roosevelt, uh, after he lost kind of the bull moose uh, election, lost the, that, that, that election, and, he, and he, man, he's looking for something to, uh, you, know, he, you know, fill this void in his life. And he ends up going on an expedition into an unknown Amazon river called the River of Doubt. All right, the River of Doubt was a tributary of the Amazon that had never been explored. Actually, it's such a treacherous journey to what, from what I can understand that it's only been descended two other times after Theodore Roosevelt did it. One of them because they felt like he lied about it. They felt like there's no way anybody actually did this. Then they did it. And then another expedition took over a month to do, just happened a few years ago. So it's only been done a few times. But Theodore Roosevelt linked up with this guy named Rondon. Uh, Rondon is very famous in Brazil. He was a, an explorer, mapped much of the Amazon. There are different rivers and different areas of the Amazon that are named after Rondon. But he was an explorer to the max. And this is what Rondon said would happen when they were in these super remote areas and you had to cross uh, rivers that were around the Amazon and tributaries. Because the thing is, crossing a river like that has treachery. You know, there's waterfalls, there's rapids. But the scariest thing in the whole river is what? It's piranhas. <laughs> and they don't happen a whole, it don't happen a whole lot. But when it happens... It's like the most terrifying thing in the world as they begin to swirl and devour and humans have been gone, I mean, shredded all the way down to skeletons. I mean, it happens. It's rare. When they would come across a river like this, this just gripped my soul. When they come across a river like this and they have to get across, you know what they would do? They would go and pick out the smallest, weakest, sickliest, man, it's not going to make the journey, oxen or cow or horse that they had. Pick the weakest one that ain't going to make it anyway. And what they would do is they would drive. He didn't want to go. He understands. They would drive him out into the middle of the river. And all it would take is one piranha to start the feeding frenzy. And as they devour this poor animal, and as he is stripped all the way down to a skeleton, you know what the rest of the expedition's doing? You know what the rest of the animals are doing? They're walking by in the river, not 10 yards away. Because as this one goes down, the rest of them get to go free. And what I would think about, and I want you to consider is this. Y'all, Jesus didn't send the sickly one. He didn't send one that was unwilling. But Jesus Christ stepped in. Jesus Christ went down. Jesus Christ was offered up that you and I could traverse the treacherous gulf that had been created by our own sin. He was devoured so that we could go free. And at the end of that journey, on the other side of that gulf, you know what words are waiting for us? The words that are waiting for us are son and daughter. I couldn't be more proud. You are more precious to me. You are beautiful. You are in the righteousness of Christ. There is nothing you can do today that's going to separate uh, me from you and my love for you. These are the words that are left for believers because of what Christ has done. And we cling to them. They are our very life. How dare we, those of us with a prophetic gifting, those of us with a teaching gift, those of us with a, an exhortation type gift, how dare we starve the church of what God has to say to them when we were not starved of what God had to say to us in our own gospel journey, right? So some of you in here are stirred by that. You're like, man, I don't know what that means. Man, for some of you, it means becoming a church planner. You say, man, I'm just working a corporate job. That's fine. God's gifted you. We're going to walk with you. For some of you, it means pastoral ministry. For some of you, it means leading a group. For some of you, it means teaching in kids. For some of you, uh, it might mean something in the community. There are other Bible studies that happen outside of Mercy Hill, at your work, things in the community. Whatever it is, off the sideline, onto the front line. If you're stirred by this today, here's the X's and O's. There's a game plan, threefold, all right? The first thing is, you got to figure out if I'm talking to you with the speaking gift. you got to discover your gifts. You say, man, how do I discover my gift? It's very simple. I can't go to like a Bible verse, but I think, I think the general wisdom of Scripture is that when you get around the church, you're going to start realizing what you have abilities for, what you have affinities for, and what there are opportunities for. And when those things all kind of come together, you're going to end up having your sweet spot, right? You say, well, ability, I don't know if I have the ability to teach. Ask some people. Try it. Like, jump out. Man, j jump off the side. Get involved and see and then ask for feedback. Man, we, we, our church is encouraging but honest. They're going to let you know, man, is this is prophetic teaching, exhortation. What about affinity? My question for you is, do you desire this? Man, do you, do you, when, 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 that, when that word comes into your soul, do you want to get it out so bad? Some of you in here, y'all, we want to plant 100 churches directly out of this church. Now, they're going to go on to plant churches. It's going to be an exponential thing. But I'm talking about 100 right from here. Many of those church planters are sitting here right now. You're working a corporate job. You know, you're thinking, man, I'm not sure what, what the next thing is. Do you love to teach? Our community group leaders, do you lead your group, but one of the highlights of your week is digging into the Word? Well, that's sort of what a pastor does. 
for about half of his time. Do you love it like that? Or maybe you're like, man, I'm not sure I'm going to plant a church, but man, I do love the word. I love to dig in. Well, man, how can that be used in terms of teaching kids or, or walking with students in their community group ministries and all of that? You know, it's, it's an affinity. I would say it like this. It's an affinity from the inside. You should have a desire for the gift on the inside, and it should be affirmed from the outside. You have the affinity that's drawing you, and you have the ability that's being confirmed by the church. And the third thing is find your opportunity, right? Jump in, lead a group, teach kids, get involved with Equip. I forgot to even say that. Our Equip ministry is an entire teaching arm. You know, some of the, most, uh, some of the classes that we have offered in Equip that, are, that, were the mo- that they're most highly rated, and we have all the surveys on this stuff, because you know who we are. We track everything, okay? Uh, we're not taught by our pastors. They're, they're, they're taught by, by lay leaders. Man, they work a job all week, but they have a passion for apologetics, for example. And, and they jump in and they teach Equip, and it's just uh, an incredible thing when the church uses their teaching gifts. Man, come talk to us. How can we get you involved? Preaching cohort is another thing that you can be involved in here. Off the side on the front line with an opportunity. Second thing I want you guys to see in terms of X's and O's, all right? First one is discover it. Can't use what you don't know you have, <laughs> right? Second thing is, man, you're like, man, I'm there. Are you sharpening it? Are you focusing on it? I want you to, I want you to imagine. Let's take a worldly example and let's talk about what God could do with your teaching gift of teaching, exhortation, of prophecy, okay? If he's already created that capacity in you and you begin to dump a little bit of fuel on it and you say, hey, I want to be in the preaching cohort. I want to start apprenticing in a small group so I can see if teaching is my thing. Like I want to start reading and listening to books and all of that uh, about this gift. If you start pouring fuel on it, what could happen if God has already given you the capacity? Let's take a worldly example, okay? There was a study that was done in the 1950s um, that was all about reading, comprehension, and speed, okay? Now, this has been peddled a few different ways, but uh, it came out of the University of Nebraska. I think you guys can see this. This is what's so interesting to me about it, okay? They took a bunch of students who read at a 90-word-per-minute rate, which is actually below average, all right? It's not quite and they said, hey, we're going to put them through months of training. And when they get to that, done with that months of training, we're going to test their speeding reading ability. And here's what they found. They found that after months of training with somebody who already had a low aptitude, man, they weren't gifted in this area. They're, maybe, they're, maybe they're high on math, high on science, something like that. But they're not just the reading. They're not gifted in that. After six months or whatever it was, they ended up at 150 words per minute, which is pretty dramatic. I mean, almost 100% you know, uh, improvement, one, you know, uh, uh, great improvement, probably 80% improvement or something like that. Now, here's what they found, okay? They took other students that started at a 150. So where these students got in six months, these were already there just naturally. They had a natural gifting, a natural aptitude for this. They put them through the same training six months later. What do you think they found? What do you think they saw? There's always somebody in the room that's going to be like, it went down, <laughs> okay? Okay. Uh, they messed with their magic. They tried to systematize everything just like our American system does and all that. 290? Oh, no. 2,900 words in a minute. What's the lesson? What's the lesson? The lesson is if you are gifted in something already, you pour gas on that. If you're not gifted in it, you can, you can improve. I'm not saying you can't. That's pretty good improvement, right? But if you are gifted in it already, then what you're going to end up seeing is that God can pour gas, I mean fire, sharpen. It can exponentially explode. You got a teaching gift? You got an exhortation gift? You got a prof- prophetic gifting? What happens when you start lining those things up and you get in a preaching cohort like we do at Mercy Hill? What happens when you start apprenticing in a group? What happens when you say, hey, man, I'm running, this, I'm running the tech part of this, whatever, but I want to start teaching kids in, the, in their setting. What happens when you say, man, I'm just going to jump out on faith. And I'm going to start a Bible study at my work. You're going to see fruit and you're going to see joy in those things. Thirdly and finally, I would say this part of the game plan, encourage others in their speaking gifts by receiving them well. Some of you are like, man, I'm not a speaker. Like, I don't, I don't do the speaking gifts. I'm a server. Well, good. The whole sermon next week is going to be for you. But you know what I'm going to tell you today, and I'm going to tell the speakers to, uh, next week? Here's what I'm going to say to you today. After preaching for a while, this is what I've learned. Sometimes, I, for example, a sermon on manhood uh, ends up helping the women in our church more than the men. And other times, a sermon on, you know, the same thing is true the other way. You preach a sermon on womanhood, sometimes it helps the men more than women. They're like, man, I finally understand now, you know, kind of. <laughs> so... Uh, <laughs> You understand what I'm saying? Like, it ma- like you, may not, you may not be a speaker. If you're not a speaker, let me ask you this. You don't know what this feels like, but can you imagine what it feels like to have a divine word burn in your soul? And it's got to come out, and you have no idea how it's going to be received. Can we have some grace for the speakers? 
Can we have a little bit of grace for those that are teachers, exhorters, prophetic types? Man, let's encourage them. Let's receive them well. Next week, I'm going to say the same thing to the speakers. The speakers are like, why don't y'all say more? You know, why don't you? Man, let's, let's, let's encourage one another and be gracious to one another. And speakers, let's receive the servers well, right? So if you're not a speaker, man, how about humility? Can you be ministered to by the speakers in our church? Let me close. Y'all, discover your gifts, find your passions, live your calling. If you are gifted to speak, speak. Let us help you with that. Man, there are people all over our church that are getting off the sidelines and onto the front lines. It it is happening. I don't want to say this or just pump you up. I want you to hear, y'all, it's happening. Thousand gift assessments have been taken. A thousand people have, have registered on No More Spectators. They've actually set up their account. Over 250 people have, have responded to a serving-oriented thing, either in the community or at our church. You say, well, 250, we're, we're a bigger church than that. That doesn't count the over 1,200 that serve week in and week out. These are new. This is what we're praying for. Like, we're praying for 400 by the end of the year. We've already seen 250. It's happening. We're excited for what God is doing. Man, it's crazy what's happening. I mean, I, I'll give you one story real quick. I went to, uh, I, I, met the, I met somebody that works at Backpack Beginnings the other day. This is what people are, man, people are getting this. It's a fire. It's starting to spread. She said, man, no more spectators. Awesome. We're getting people inquiring. People are signing up to serve. She said, we had a bit of a, a glitch with the website. It said 12 a.m. instead of 12 p.m. People are signing up, and then I'm having to email them. They're thinking that they're signing up to pack backpacks at midnight, <laughs> and they're signing up. All right, it was just a glitch. It's like, no, you come at noon. You don't have to come at midnight. But people were like, oh, that's great. You know, I was about to like show up in the middle of the night. I mean, people are moving the sideline to front line. Man, what God, what's God doing in your life? Do you have a speaking gift? You ready, to, you ready to do that? Maybe you can use it here. Like I mentioned a bunch of things. Maybe you're like, hey, I have a speaking gift, but other people can use it. Different ministry. Maybe you're thinking to yourself, hey, I have a speaking gift, but it's not on y'all's website. Like there's a thousand things people could be doing that aren't on the website. Maybe you teach in a different area. This is a weakness of No More Spectators that we've recognized and corrected this week. If you've looked on there because you're like, man, I want to be a part. I want to be counted. I want to be off the sideline. I already am doing these things, but there's nowhere for me to sign up because of what I'm doing. But I want you guys to notice on our community page, uh, right here, other community organizations. If you're like, man, I lead a Bible study at work. I do something with BSF. I do, you know, and there's no place for me on No More Spectators. There is now. We can't capture them all. Hey, you tell us what you're doing. Maybe we want to jump behind you. Start funneling some people. You click on that, it's going to look like this. Hey, I'm, what are the organiza- this is an organization that I'm currently serving in with my speaking gift. So others of you are doing it. You're doing it here. You're doing it in the community. But listen, there are some of you in here that are just not doing it. You're gifted to teach, you're gifted to exhort, you're gifted to prophesy. Man, are you going from the sideline to the front line? We need to start measuring maturity, not by what we consume, but how we contribute. It's not by attendance, it's by impact. All right, how are you doing impact? How are you doing? God is seeking to use you. All right, let's pray. Father, I pray right now, God, that you would, just in your grace and kindness and the way that you do, Lord, I pray that you would convict our church. God, I pray that you would move Lord, I pray you would prompt us in mighty ways to get off the sideline. Lord, there are so many teachers and exhorters and prophetic voices in our church that are being used mightily for your kingdom. God, I cheer them on. Continue to tell them, continue to lead, continue to speak, continue to lead kids, continue to lead in community groups, continue to to preach. God, I pray that our elders would continue to use their teaching giftings as they coach our community group leaders. God, I pray. I cheer them on. I pray they would continue, not grow weary in that. But Lord, there are so many that are on the sideline. They have giftings and they are withholding words to the church that you have for them. God, I pray instead of withholding those things, they would let them loose and we'd be encouraged and built up in the process in Christ's name. Amen. Hey guys, thanks for stopping by our YouTube channel. We hope that this, uh, this message is encouraging to you. We hope it stirs up your affections for Christ. If it's doing that, we would encourage you to subscribe to our channel. You can also share this message. If it's working in your life, maybe God wants to use it in somebody else's life, so you can always do that. Let me say a quick word to those of you who might be seeing this for the first time, or maybe you've been following our YouTube channel or listening to our teaching, but you haven't quite made that jump to come into the church yet. We know in today's society, most people listen to the teaching teaching ministry of a church before they ever check it out. So uh, we know that might be a lot of people out there. If that's you, I would just encourage you to take that step. If you don't have a local church, man, don't rely on a teaching ministry on YouTube to be the local church because it's not the local church. 
We would love for you to come in and plug in, to use your gifts, to get into some relationships where people uh, can actually push on you and, and you can be ministering in their life. Uh, there's no such thing as a Lone Ranger Christian. So man, come join us, take that step. We would love to meet you. Last thing I would say is this, hey, we know guys that the mission of God goes about as far as the generosity of God's people takes it. Um, if this message is a blessing to you or if you could see how it could be used in other people's lives, uh, we would really encourage you to financially support the ministry here at Mercy Hill. And you can do that by going to mercyhillchurch.com and uh, going right to our give page uh, and giving there. Uh, we love to see that happen as we continue to expand. All right. Thanks a lot, guys. We'll see you next time.